Welcome to the uh, 12th evening of Pony Debates the Issues, the live version. Uh, and thanks to the Pony staff, Mark Jansen, Chris Jones, John Warden, for, for making it happen. These debates are one aspect of the contribution of Pony, uh, the project on nuclear issues, um, the, that Pony makes in rethinking nuclear weapons policy strategy, uh, operations, infrastructure, arms control, nonproliferation. Since John Hamry and Clark Murdoch uh, started Pony almost a decade ago, uh, Pony conferences, the international outreach, the nuclear scholars initiative, all those things have helped uh, build a community, uh, linking younger folks just getting into the field with those who've been in the field a long time, uh, and, and all those in between. Uh, I think the big strategic issues uh, are always fresh, and we always need to look at them with, with fresh eyes and uh, be sure that we look, we're looking at them in the context of contemporary issues. We have two experts with us tonight who will be debating uh, damage limitation. Uh, Dr. Kier Lieber is an associate professor at Georgetown University in the Security Studies Program. Dr. James Acton is a senior associate uh, in the uh, Nuclear Policy Program at Carnegie Endowment. Um, as for the topic of this evening's debate, uh, it's been a while, I think, since we've heard much or read much about damage limitations. So I think it's an issue that's ripe for looking at with fresh eyes uh, and re-examining in today's context. Um, in tonight's debate, I hope to learn what damage limitation means in today's context, uh, why it is good or bad, and under what circumstances. Uh, do we evaluate it differently for different adversaries, North Korea, Russia, China, or those different circumstances. Uh, if we're going to do it, how do we do it, and how much do we do it? If we're not going to do it, what's the alternate philosophy? What's the presence do with these weapons uh, should deterrence fail? These are all very difficult questions, and I'm looking forward to hearing our debaters uh, address them this evening. Thanks uh, to both Kier and to James for taking this on. All right, thanks so much for Elaine for the introduction. Um, I'm John Warden and I work here at the Project on Nuclear Issues and would like to again thank both of the, the debaters for agreeing to come do this. Um, the specific um, statement that we're debating tonight is resolved that damage limitation should be an important consideration in U.S. nuclear planning. And the format that we have is we have Dr. Lieber is going to defend the affirmative, and he's going to start with an opening speech, and that'll be followed by a cross-examination. And then Dr. Acton will defend the negative side, and that will also be followed by a cross-examination. And then after those opening speeches, we'll, I'll ask a couple moderator questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor, and hopefully you all will have some additional questions as well. So without further ado, Dr. Lieber. Great, thanks. Should I turn this down? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and start with a definition um, uh, as per Elaine's instructions. Um, uh, the definition of damage limitation, just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. I think we're talking about the same thing. Uh, damage limitation is the ability to destroy or minimize an adversary's capacity to use nuclear weapons. It typically, uh, the term typically includes things like missile defense and civil defense, but I, I think when the rubber hits the road, what we're most likely to disagree about or really want to focus on here is uh, counterforce capabilities, uh, uh, capabilities that are targeted at and capable of destroying an adversary's nuclear weapons. I think damage limitation should be an important consideration in U.S. nuclear planning for two main reasons. First, uh, damage limitation may be crucial for deterrence. And second, damage limitation would be necessary if deterrence fails. Let me just take these two in order. First, the deterrence mission. You know, the biggest obstacle uh, for understanding the utility of damage limitation, counterforce forces today, um, lies in the fact that most analysts uh, and most nuclear analysts cut their teeth during the Cold War. Uh, everything they learned about nuclear weapons, they learned during the Cold War or shortly after or were conditioned by the Cold War. Everything they thought they needed to know about nuclear weapons and deterrence, they derived from the Cold War experience. But the Cold War is over. The Cold War framework 
is inappropriate for understanding the problem of nuclear deterrence today. So quick recap, back then the goal of U.S. nuclear strategy was to deter a Soviet slash Warsaw Pact attack against the United States and NATO. And the goal was to make sure that the leader of the Soviet Union did not wake up one morning and think, gee, you know, today's a great day to start uh, to invade and conquer Western Europe, right? That was the foremost objective of U.S. nuclear strategy. The strategy itself was to ensure that any adversary, conventional or nuclear attack would quickly escalate to all-out nuclear war. In other words, we wanted to escalate. We wanted to ensure escalation, not, and we did this because we thought we would lose that conventional war for most of the Cold War. We did this not because we wanted to die, but because we wanted to deter. The goal, strategy, forces. What forces did we build? What capability did we have? We built a lot of different kinds of capability, but the high-yield, city-busting force that we had was well suited for this deterrence mission. Right? Damage limitation, especially in the latter half of the Cold War, in my mind, um, uh, it might have been useful in the first half of the Cold War, but that mission became a pipe dream. The damage limitation mission of the United States launching a first strike against the Soviet Union um, in a way that no retaliatory forces remained. In the 1980s, some academic colleagues did an analysis of this. Um, and the best that they could get, the best result that they could get from running the numbers, doing a net assessment of a U.S. first strike on the Soviet force, left hundreds of uh, surviving Soviet weapons that could be used to retaliate. This is damage limitation strategy did not work. And rightfully so, arms controllers during the Cold War, latter half of the Cold War in particular, argued that the pursuit of damage limitation only signaled malign intentions exacerbated hostility um, uh, uh, and instability and raised the danger of provoking a preemptive nuclear attack by the adversary. But times have changed, and the heart of the problem for U.S. nuclear strategy today and for the foreseeable future is the possession and proliferation of nuclear weapons to potential regional adversaries. Specifically, the big problem now is the prospect of those adversaries escalating to the nuclear level during a conventional conflict. Right. Let me just clarify, I'll say a bit more about this. Daryl Press and I have written about this. You can go read our article on Foreign Affairs, um, uh, November, December 2009. I want to emphasize just a couple points. First of all, this does not, this problem, of course, of nuclear escalation does not depend on a deranged uh, dictator, a deranged actor, um, an irrational or suicidal actor. The problem is that if the United States fights conventional conflicts against any of these regional nuclear armed states, it will face a great danger of both rational escalation and inadvertent nuclear escalation. There are two different paths, the rational path, a, a, a potential regional adversary facing um, the prospect of defeat, which would be likely given U.S. conventional superiority, would understand the consequences of defeat to be terrible, possibly the end of the regime in any scenario we can really think of. And therefore, nuclear coercion appears as a rational strategy to coerce the United States or its allies to stop military operations, to coerce an end to the conflict before it's too late. That's the rational path. There's also an inadvertent path, which people sometimes miss, which is that the nature of modern war, where particularly where the U.S. fights its wars, we blind and confuse our adversary, we take out its eyes, ears, nose, throat, etc. Uh, this is, in many cases, going to look like the precursor of a preemptive U.S. nuclear strike, and therefore nuclear escalation uh, may become appealing. Unless we are simply done with conventional war, period, and the record of U.S. foreign policy since the end of the Cold War certainly doesn't lend much evidence to that, uh, uh, that view, nuclear proliferation to regional adversaries increases the odds that U.S. leaders will face nuclear escalation. So in short, the key problem for nuclear strategy today is not that a potential adversary leader might wake up one morning with the thought of nuking South Korea or Tokyo or Los Angeles. Um, you probably don't need damage limitation capability to deter that. Rather, the problem of limited nuclear escalation uh, will emerge as a consequence of the highly plausible situation in which the U.S. seeks to defend its foreign allies and other vital national interests abroad. So compare then and now, and it, get to your answer here. The goal today is still similar. We want to deter nuclear attack. That is the fundamental purpose of U.S. nuclear strategy. 
of nuclear weapons. The strategy itself is fundamentally different, though. Back then, we wanted to ensure escalation. Now, we do not want escalation. Not surprisingly, with that strategy being radically different, the capabilities needed for the goal are also fundamentally different. City busting is not a good deterrent, given the new deterrence challenges of the post-Cold War world. City busting, as a response to a limited nuclear escalation, for example, an adversary that starts going up the escalatory ladder, maybe uh, an EMP burst, but maybe hits U.S. Um, forces in the region, an allied force, an allied city, uh, all those we typically would describe as a limited, uh, a limited nuclear escalation as opposed to all-out nuclear war. Uh, a city-busting response in the midst of a conventional conflict is not a credible threat in that case. That posture simply may not convince a desperate adversary to forego escalation. The fact of the matter is that damage limitation counterforce capabilities, especially those that don't entail killing millions of people, which is what a city busting strategy would do, may prove to be a far better deterrent. An adversary is less likely to think about going down a path if that path could suddenly drop off a cliff. Now, inevitably, there is a tension here between, how much time now? One minute? Got it. Inevitably, a tension here between the possible effects of damage limitation capabilities, that is contributing to deterrence, as I've suggested, uh, versus making an adversary so insecure that it lashes out. There are good reasons for it. my good colleague James Acton and others to be nervous that counterforce capabilities could exacerbate rather than deter escalation. But A, the alternative force, no damage limitation capabilities, only city busting, would undermine credibility and thus does nothing to address and does nothing to address escalation problems. B, it's inconceivable that we wouldn't include the ability to defend our allies as an important consideration in defense planning, which leads to the second and final point, given my time constraints, if deterrence fails. Right? The consequences of failure to deter nuclear escalation in the midst of a conventional war are enormous. Here again, only damage limitation counterforce capabilities can contribute much. If deterrence fails and an adversary actually starts going down the escalation road, significant counterforce capabilities may offer the prospect of a successful disarming attack against the adversary. And even if a splendid first strike were untenable, counterforce capabilities could well limit the damage to our allies and to us from adversary nuclear use. Simply put, the U.S. might need to use nuclear weapons to destroy critical targets that can't be destroyed with conventional means. Thank you. Back in the nukes you, we need, which you wrote in 2009, which I very much encourage everybody here to read, uh, you looked at a uh, U.S. attack on Chinese silos. Sorry, I'm sorry. You, you looked at a U.S. attack on 20 silos. And the reason you looked at that was because that was the approximate size of China's current long-range silo-based missile force. Two years later, do you still think that was the right target set to examine? Yes. So you think damage limitation is about destroying silo-based ICBMs and not uh, mobile ICBMs, for instance? It could well be mobile ICBMs. Um, can I offer a, a longer response? Or um, In the article, uh, uh, Nukes We Need, we did, we did a notional counterforce attack on the Chinese arsenal, 20 long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. right? Um, for several different reasons. First of all, to show that prior analyses of such a counterforce strike, which resulted in the deaths of something like three million Chinese uh, civilians, um, wouldn't, would not necessarily be the approach a U.S. leader would take but you want to, to address that problem. But, but you want to address the issue of why you didn't look at mobile missiles in that study? Sure. The, and the point of, your, the, point of the, the question is somehow that mobile missiles um, obviate the ability to conduct a counterforce strike. Right? Well, I'm going to get sure I'm gonna, I'm gonna get onto that later. I just want us to establish what target set the U.S. needs to destroy if it wants to do serious damage limitation against China. Okay. And so you agree with me that it's both silo-based ICBMs and mobile it ICBMs. Could be, and it could be a uh, sea-based force as well. The, yeah. reason, the reason we focused on the 20 ICBMs is we're trying to do the same kind of analysis that others had done to show that this was a terrible solution to use nuclear weapons against nuclear weapons because it would kill millions of people. We had just laid out a scenario where a U.S. leader 
might c contemplate such an action if they feared Los Angeles or Tokyo or other states, other targets were being hit. And therefore, we conducted the same analysis using lower yield, highly accurate weapons to do a realistic counterforce strike, which resulted in a far lower casualty figures. And when you take into account the silo-based ICBMs and the road mobile ICBMs, do you know roughly how many uh, 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 missiles you end up having to destroy? haven't done the analysis against a mobile So person. just to let you all know, China has about 30 to 45 mobile missiles, ICBMs, and about the same number of launchers. Um, what about the IRBMs and the MRBMs, which don't have the range to hit uh, the continental United States, but do have the range to hit uh, US allies? Um, do you think uh, destroying those missiles is an important part of damage limitation? It would depend on the context. In the context we used in the analysis, it was not an important part. What would be the political context in which the United States was worried about destroying ICBMs but not shorter range missiles? In what way could the U.S. get into a conflict with China that would not involve a U.S. ally? Give me one example. I didn't suggest it wouldn't involve a U.S. ally. The alternative, of course, which you're leading to, is that the ally has no alternative, that the U.S. has nothing that it could do to possibly reduce damage to its allies. Remember the scenario. Right? A conventional war, say, against China over Taiwan. And in that conventional war, China is losing and decides exactly. to hit an allied base with a nuclear weapon. Exactly. And threatens, so it's, and so threatens it's, more. Exactly. In so two worlds, one so world we over. have... Uh, am, is this statements or answers here? In one world, in one world, we have counterforce capabilities. And we can plausibly suggest that we can begin to limit damage against an adversary. Uh, uh, in another world, we do not have damage limitation capabilities, in which case we can only threaten to nuke Beijing and Shanghai and a bunch of other targets. Which right, but you... And millions of people okay, dead. thanks, Kit. Notice but the difference. What, Last Kit, point Kit, I'll make. Notice okay. the difference. Okay. No, 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 okay. Kit, Kit, Honestly, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly, right. this is my cross-examination. One, one okay. world yeah. what, you have, what you have argued... Let the what, witness what speak. You have, what you have argued is that in your study... All right, hey, let's, let's move on to the statement. So you can use this... You can start your statement if you want, but we should end the cross-examination. You want to end cross-examination? Yes, please. Last night, I had a dream. And my dream was that I was going to leave this field um, and um, become a, a sprinter. Because the thing that I really want to do right now is to win the 100 meters in front of my home crowd at the London Olympics. I can think of nothing more I would want than that. But what occurred to me is just because I want it doesn't make it practical. And with all due respect to my good friend here, the problem with Keir's analysis is it's a touch over academic. The practical challenges of strategically meaningful damage limitation are not correctly modeled by destroying 20 silos. So what I'm going to argue for you today is two things. Firstly, that mutual vulnerability is a fact, not a choice and that damage limitation to the extent that a president would find a nuclear war less unattractive is not available. And secondly, that there are costs to pursuing this course. Let me say what we agree upon. I fully agree with Keir about his statement of the problem. He is completely right that it would be rational for an adversary in a conventional conflict to use nuclear weapons if it feared losing. The difference is his solution doesn't solve that problem. The other thing we agree about is that the Cold War is over, though listening to some of his remarks, that might surprise you. Yes, the Cold War is over, and that's actually made damage limitation harder because of the development of mobile missiles. And that's what this debate fundamentally boils down to, a question of efficacy. China has 145 to, uh, between 145 to 180 missiles, according to Chinese military power 2010. I know it's not called Chinese military power anymore, but I can't remember the new name. The vast majority of those missiles are mobile. And when I asked Keir to name a circumstance in which the shorter range missiles would not be relevant, he came up with Taiwan, in which they obviously would be relevant, because in a conflict over Taiwan, that would be an obvious target, as would the Japan, as would the, because the Seventh Fleet is based there. So the question then becomes, can you get strategically meaningful damage limitation against mobile missiles? In the 1991 Gulf War, the United States and its allies flew 1,460 sorties against mobile missiles, 
related targets. There was a grand total of zero confirmed kills. In the 2006 Lebanon war, Israeli capacities, which are not all that dissimilar from US capacities in this regard, superficially had performed much better. Israel destroyed 80 to 90% of Hezbollah's long and medium ranged transporter erector launchers. But when you dig a bit deeper, what you find out is these capabilities that the Israelis had that are pretty similar to US capabilities would be useless against a nuclear armed adversary. Israel detected enemy transporter erector launchers by detecting the missiles after they had been launched. Okay? That would not be an effective damage limitation strategy. If you want to do effective damage limitation, you have to destroy transporter erector launchers simultaneously because when you start destroying some of them, the others are going to launch. Israel destroyed 50 in 40 minutes, astonishingly impressive. The next 50 it destroyed in two days, less impressive. Israel made its successes by flooding Lebanon with UAVs that were loitering there. This would be a much harder strategy against Chinese air defenses. I'd also posit that the second artillery in China is probably a touch more adept than Hezbollah at hiding missiles. And more than that, that China is a slightly bigger country than Lebanon. So the challenges of tracking down mobile missiles are, are exacerbated. So we have no reason to think whatsoever that a damage limiting strike against dispersed Chinese mobile missiles would be anything less than spectacularly ineffective and would not make a nuclear exchange less attractive to a president, which is what deterrence is fundamentally about. In fact, there are even other difficulties that, I have, uh, that I'm not even going to go into in huge depth. China is developing um, conventional missiles, such as the DF-21D, which is essentially indistinguishable from the nuclear DF-21A. So it's not just enough to destroy nuclear weapons because you don't know which ones they are. You've got to destroy the conventional mobile missiles as well. China has an anti-satellite capability, which would be extremely effective at disrupting the ISR capabilities, the intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities that the US needs to, to, uh, to hunt these things down. And finally, there is, massive new, there is considerable numerical uncertainty over the number of missiles China has. If you don't know how many missiles you need to destroy, you don't know you've got all of them or most of them. And let's not forget, it's Keir who set his own target in the nukes we need as, quote, completely disarming an enemy. We cannot get anywhere near that against mobile missiles. Let me briefly address the costs of this strategy. Keir hasn't sat down and thought how to implement this strategy in practice the Defense Science Board did in 2009. It looked at destroying 10, 10 mobile ICBMs in a regional power as opposed to a compare competitor, and it was very emphatic about that. Of all of the options it scoped out for doing this capability, the most expensive came in at 20 billion and did not provide a good capability against a rogue state with 10 mobile ICBMs. The Defense Science Board says it's very expensive and you can't do it. And finally and briefly, because I know it would disappoint Keir enormously if I didn't make this argument, you have the problem of crisis instability. Otherwise known as shooting at silos doesn't achieve very much if they're already empty. And the problem there is that if somehow China and Russia wrongly came to believe that the US had a credible damage limiting option or indeed any other adversary, they would have a stronger incentive to use their nuclear weapons first for exactly the reasons that Keir says. Because what they would want to do is try and coerce the United States into backing down. If they thought a nuclear strike was imminent, it would be an entirely rational and logical strategy to, do a, to have a limited use of nuclear weapons in, uh, in an attempt to terrify the US population. I make no claim whether that would be an effective or a successful strategy. What I do argue is it would be a rational strategy and one that Kia's solution to this problem only makes worse. So I don't think damage limitation, um, so from a strategic perspective, Damage limitation is not effective enough to set the goals that Keir himself has outlined it, and it's expensive, and it actually only makes the problem that he identifies worse.
I'll take the high ground now. Uh, please limit your responses to yes or no answers. Um, <laughs> would, you rec would you recommend damage limitation planning for a conflict against North Korea? That's simple yes or no would be good. It's complicated. Would you recommend damage limitation planning against a future nuclear armed Iran? The serious answer to both the North Korea and the Iran question is, you know, I have no objection to ballistic missile defense. I absolutely would not concede in a rhetorical way mutual vulnerability with them. But the Defense Science Board itself says that the United States cannot successfully destroy 10 mobile ICBMs in a, in a, in a rogue state, even if you spend $20 billion on the capability of doing so. So I would not invest in new counterforce capabilities that I didn't need for other purposes over an Iran or North Korea scenario. And by your focus on that, I assume that you're now conceding the material on China. Do you believe that conventional war is obsolete? That nope. the United States will not get involved in a conventional war uh, uh, abroad? I, I, th I believe conventional war is not obsolete. The United States could get into a conventional okay. war abroad. What is your solution for dealing with the coercive nuclear escalatory strategy that an adversary would either rationally adapt, adopt, quite likely, or inadvertently? Well, I don't have an obvious solution. So but if but, a, but I, what I wouldn't do is something that made the problem worse. I don't have to demonstrate I have a solution to this problem. Deterrence might fail. There might be nothing we can do about that. The problem is that by uh, attempting to take out their missiles, you exacerbate the problem. And that's all I have to say we wouldn't do, exacerbate the problem. If the United problem. States in a conventional war against China or against North Korea, if the adversary used two, four kiloton nuclear weapons against Tokyo, would you tell the Japanese that there's nothing we can do, we're going to continue to conduct the operation, even if that meant 12 to 15 more, four kiloton nuclear weapons would be used against Tokyo? Well, so I would, I, I would do a couple of things in those scenarios. Firstly, I think there are targets between damage limitation targets and city targets that, are, that you can take out. Uh, the kind of scenario as you correctly identify would almost certainly be in a conventional conflict. So to the extent that there were conventional assets, I think those would be very credible first targets. Secondly, if I could go after North Korean leadership, I would absolutely go after North Korean leadership. And thirdly, if I happened to know where mobile nuclear weapons were and I happened to be taking them out, I, I happened to be able to take them out, I would do so. But I would not invest in capabilities specifically for the purpose of doing so because they are ineffective and exacerbate the problem. Final question. If the United States had ISR capabilities to target mobile missiles with low yield nuclear weapons in such a conflict, would you not recommend that? If I were um, six inches taller, uh, much stronger and much faster than I would recommend myself running the Olympics. But that's actually not a problem in the real world. The question so was if we had those capabilities. If we have I don't understand how I can answer a hypothetical for a scenario. Are we that working on exist. ISR capabilities? Do you uh, know the status of those ISR capabilities against mobile missiles? The Defense Science Board uh, says that the type of capabilities you need are covert loitering capabilities, and I see no evidence that the U.S. is working on capabilities in those numbers suitable for operating over a hostile air airspace environment in the numbers required for the mission that you assign. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much for the start. Um, I'll start with a couple quick questions and then we'll open it to the audience. Um, I'll start with Dr. Lieber. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the debate, or James focused the debate on our capability against China. Um, so if, w is it actually possible for us to carry out a damage limitation strike against China? So I guess my question is, if the United States made made it clear that its policy was to pursue damage limitation and started investing in the capabilities that, that you talked about, that you think that we should, improvements in ISR, more lower yield capabilities, so that we could threat, credibly carry out a damage limitation strategy. Yeah. It seems, oh, sorry, I'll, no, I'll, sorry, I'll continue the question, and then you can have a long response. No, it's a good, it's a good question. Look, what's happened here is that uh, James has basically acknowledged that damage limitation, he wants to limit it just to missile defense, but the whole concept of uh, uh, preventing, you know, preventing an adversary from using nuclear weapons is an appropriate strategy for a set of cases. 
uh, a set of regional nuclear weapons cases, like I would say North Korea, Iran, and Syria. He also didn't mention the, the word Russia, and I've also written a piece about Russia, but presumably he would say that um, uh, a damage limitation against Russia is not a wise strategy, uh, in large part because of its mobile missile, mobile ICBM force. Um, I agree with, so we agree on two of the categories, right? The smaller regional armed adversaries who don't have robust mobile forces and the Russian force, which has a large one. In one case, damage limitation is good. In the other, it's bad. Basically agree about that. The reality is the China case is a mixed bag. It's somewhere in between. Is it headed towards the Russian category? Yes, I think so. I mean, it sure will help if they actually get to put uh, nuclear missiles on their subs and they've established uh, uh, regular uh, mobile missile deterrent patrols, but let's not get carried away. We know it's really hard to hunt mobile missiles with conventional means. It's probably less hard with nuclear means, even low-yield nuclear means. And the big question that I ended with is simply that we don't know, James doesn't know, I don't know, but we, about ISR capabilities, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. But Lord knows we're working very hard at it. We're spending a lot of money on it. And my guess is we're getting very good at it. Um, uh, Things well, let me are just on the edge, really and so quick. there's a, te it's a it's, these are technical, highly classified points, but whether they're small intercontinental forces vulnerable to preemption depends on highly classified analyses of issues relating to our ISR capabilities, the interaction of those capabilities, and other things we may or may not be doing to locate mobile missiles. So, um, it, but it seems like at some point the, the United States as a policy has to make a decision about whether or not it's worth it to invest all that money to try to counter what China is building up. So if China starts investing in things like more mobile missiles, if they increase the launch readiness of their missiles, if they invest in, in MIRVs that make it so that our missile defense is less effective, then probably no matter what investments we make, they're going to have a survivable force. So when, what exactly is the calculus that the United States should be using to determine whether or not investing in damage limitation is the right decision? It certainly depends on the adversary force. And so, again, as I suggested, as we suggested in our article, as we've I've never suggested otherwise, I would expect China to establish a real survivable nuclear retaliatory force. In those circumstances, dam damage limitation is a much less appealing uh, scenario. All I'm suggesting is that we may or may not be the year there yet, and we're close enough, and we're working on capabilities to undermine their capabilities. This is not a clear case. This is not like uh, Russia and, Ni and Soviet Union in 1984. Yeah. And anybody who suggests otherwise is jumping the gun on this one. Then you're also left with all these other scenarios where damage limitation is a necessary, arguably useful uh, uh, um, uh, uh, tool to have in the arsenal. And instead, arms control folks like James want to simply get rid of it. And they have no alternative for how you're going to handle that nuclear escalatory challenge uh, uh, in that kind of conflict. Okay, uh, a couple questions for James. Um, if, if I follow your comments, it seems that you, at least on some level, think that there is some benefit for the United States either pursuing or at least planning for damage limitation strikes against countries like North Korea and Iran, but that it's not worth the investment for the United States to keep damage limitation as part of its nuclear planning against Russia and China because of feasibility concerns and also just because of the level of investment, crisis instability for all those reasons. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is just, what, can you just a little bit more flesh out the difference? And also, w at what point would Iran or what capabilities would Iran or North Korea have to have where we would start saying that mutual vulnerability as opposed to damage limitation is the policy we should be pursuing? So with Iran and North Korea, and incidentally, it's interesting that Daryl is now, um, <laughs> sorry, it's interesting Keir is now saying that um, damage limitation against Russia is a bad strategy when his international security paper said that we could execute a perfect damage limiting strike against Russia. But putting that, pu so. putting that, putting that fact aside, um, the Defense Science Board, I mean, if you don't need to listen to my analysis, listen to the product of classified U.S. analysis, says that it is not within the capability of the U.S to develop um, the necessary capabilities uh, to destroy uh, a rogue state with uh, 10 mobile ICBMs. Obviously, in the event of a conflict, if I happen to know where they were, which is extremely unlikely, after they had used nuclear weapons, I would try and destroy them, obviously. 
But the point is that the challenge of hunting those things down is so difficult, and it's not cost effective at the margins, their, count, their, their countermeasures to our countermeasures are easier and faster and cheaper than the countermeasures we would have to take, that I would not invest in specific capabilities. I would have no intention of rhetorically accepting mutual vulnerability with those states, um, none whatsoever, but, uh, there is a, but, but I wouldn't invest in capabilities specifically to perform a mission that I was incapable of doing. And let me make one more general point here, which is I don't have to give you a solution to this problem. If my solution, which is just keep on doing what we're doing, doesn't make the situation worse, and Keir's solution makes it worse, then you should probably go with what I'm suggesting rather than what he's suggesting. Okay, I have, I have one more question for, for both of you to answer, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so it seems like one alternative strategy that might be between the positions that both of you are advocating would be to invest in some of the um, the life extension programs or modernization programs that would give us more y lower yield capability that would be usable. But then for the United States to still maintain an overt policy of not pursuing damage limitation against Russia and China. So therefore, in some of these scenarios that you've described, such as a Taiwan contingency or a fight over North Korea, a fight over Japan, if an adversary, say China, used nuclear weapons, the United States could retaliate with lower yield nuclear weapons that are more usable, but it would do so in a way that would signal to China that they're not trying to eliminate all their nuclear capability, essentially giving them an out or a way, way to step down. Um, so what do you think about that as an alternative to damage limitation? Is that something that's worth considering or on both sides? Well, if I, I mean, if I, if I understand it, your question correctly, I mean, my response is that the that the only damage limitations can give you any kind of flexibility in, that, in a scenario in which you've described, in which I've described, in which I doubt that James Acton thinks is an impossible scenario to emerge. In fact, he said, if in these circumstances, what would I do? I would do nothing. You are a U.S. commander leading a, you are a U.S. president when the United States is moving up the Korean Peninsula toward Pyongyang, Pyongyang nukes Kadena, uh, U.S. Uh, base on uh, uh, Okinawa. Um, and says more is to come unless you stop this conflict, unless you halt where, what you're doing. His solution, do nothing. Keep fighting. Keep moving on Pyongyang. Arrest their leaders. Send them to the Hague for war crimes trials. I believe that that is not the best response. The best response is to respond in a way that eliminates their ability to continue to escalate. He says it's all or nothing. Um, when, all, all or nothing, you got to get every single one. At this point in time, nuclear weapons, the nuclear threshold has already been crossed. We're talking about deterrence in target times, but that's the whole point of nuclear weapons. In terms of the force itself, just very quickly, uh, what kind of force are we talking about? Damage limitation? I'm not suggesting, you know, brand new kinds of capabilities. I wouldn't mind seeing some new capabilities if you ask me. But what we're talking about are subtle implications for the force, right? Do we want to improve the tr Trident missile accuracy? I say do it. The proposal for the B-61 LEP, that could result in increased accuracy. I say let's do it. Uh, make the F-35 nuclear capable. Do it. This is not, in terms of money, I know this is tough budget times, these are not tremendously expensive uh, uh, kinds of capabilities. Replace the old outcome with a new outcome, even that. We're not talking about fancy new capabilities. We're talking about retaining or improving existing capabilities in a way that would have a minimal impact on the defense budget. Why would you get rid of a useful tool in your toolbox? I, I don't know about you, I didn't hear myself say I would do nothing if North Korea <laughs> used nuclear weapons in a conflict. What I thought I heard myself say was, yes, I would retaliate with nuclear weapons, but not fall into Keir's false dichotomy. What would you hit with nuclear weapons? I, uh, not fall into Keir's false dichotomy of pretending the only possible target sets are adversary nuclear forces uh, and cities. Uh, presumably, this is in the middle of a conventional conflict. I think the most credible targets you could hit would be the air bases, the naval bases, whatever the North Korean assets were, or the Chinese assets, or the Iranian assets, whatever it was involved in the conflict. That would be my first step up the escalation ladder, point number one. Point number two is what I've said all along, is if by some miracle I happen to know where these fleeting assets were, in the event of a conflict, I would go after them. 
but I think that's very unlikely, and I wouldn't invest in capabilities, and it's particularly the ISR you need. I wouldn't invest in capabilities that were very expensive and be unlikely to do so, and thirdly, I would get, I would get whichever leader uh, had, had done so. So no, I didn't think I said nothing. Uh, in terms of the force structure issues, ISR in destroying mobile targets is everything. So I think there is very little utility going after lower yield weapons unless you also go after the ISR, which for reasons I've explained already, I don't think is effective enough to merit a huge <coughs> investment. And these are strained budget times, and I know it's very easy in a university just to kind of say, oh, these are not big ticket items, oh, just spend more too, money on everything, hurting. everything, everything. But actually, you know, in, in a world of constrained budgets, I think the Obama administration's plan to revitalize the US complex, the weapon production capabilities, is the right place to spend the money, not on actual new capabilities themselves. OK, so let's go to audience questions with a promise that both of you will get closing remarks. Um, yes, Ambassador Brooks. Yes. Um, I thought I understood your argument until you started giving specific examples. Um, I don't understand how a low yield weapon is any better or worse against a tell. I mean, I don't understand that. I don't understand how the B61 or an album is of particular value against the tell. I mean, it seems to me that the logic of your strategy is better ISR than we have today and um, ballistic missile attack. And, and so I, I, I'd be interested in, in why your examples weren't about ballistic missiles. And then the second question is, you said that once China, and this is really all about China, moves to sea, the strategy is much less likely. Is it a fair statement that to embrace your strategy, you have to believe that you can solve the ISR problem before they solve the JL2 problem. I mean, the submarines are there, the submarines work. So if the missile works, um, which we don't all want. I mean, the Chinese military power, which I also can't remember the name for, uh, says that we don't know when it's going to be operational. But, but doesn't the logic of your strategy depend on, on a pretty dramatic breakthrough in ISR very quickly because all of this goes away once there's a significant Chinese ship to sea. And then, James, I got kind of confused. Um, we can use the Korean example, we can use a Chinese example. Um, if I correctly understood you, you would not attack and seek to destroy nuclear weapons belonging to uh, the North Koreans unless they'd already been used. If I really heard you correctly, would you explain to me why that, you know, why if it were your kid slugging up the peninsula, you'd, you'd think that was the right Strategy. Okay. Um, first, uh, apologies uh, for confusing you on this one. I, uh, um, it's um, there is nothing that you can do with a 10 kiloton tactical nuke against um, either a tell or a silo that you can't also do better with a W88, you know, four, 375 kiloton, 55 kiloton um, nuclear weapon from a uh, fire from a sub. Um, uh, the reason that low yield is preferable to high yield, all things being equal, is that you can lower you, is much fewer casualties. That, that's all I'm trying to get at. So in other words, when we did our original analysis of going after Chinese silos, we didn't do, as the NRDC did, 
use a bunch of W88s, which result in fallout that kills millions of people. We use low yield uh, um, uh, weapons against those same silos in a way that would be militarily effective, but reduce casualties. But do you agree that as a practical matter, this has to be ballistic missiles delivered? That we're fine. No, but uh, uh, Alcums or, or B61s, um, again, yeah, you'd have to address penetration issues and things like that. But I mean, there's nothing inherently that limits it to somehow making, in fact, those are the least useful weapons for the kind of attack that we're talking about. Um, configuring a W88 to only have its primary go off or, or, or whatever. I mean, for us, the issue is achieving low, having low yields. Yeah, but the primary only W88 is, you know, I can get that before I can get any of the rest of this. R right. I'm suggesting that the key capabilities are those low yield uh, uh, weapons in the force, the Alcom's B-61s, okay? And the reason that we like those better than we like the big city busting uh, uh, weapons is because of the, the civilian casualty implications. And again, to me, it really does matter if a U.S. president faced, had two options, one of which was to kill three million Chinese, and the other is to kill a thousand Chinese in a conventional war in which thousands are probably already dying. Um, that is a big difference. So it is about the silos. It, It has been an article of faith among nuclear planners that if you tell somebody a nuclear weapon is coming to a tell, one of two things will happen. The tell will move, in which case you will blow up some location, or the tell will shoot. Therefore, prior to tonight, I always believe that if you wanted to use nuclear weapons against tells in a country the size of China, that you had to get them there by ballistic missile. I understand the low yield height, that's fine. And, and I'm, you clearly have a different view, and I'm trying to understand why, why you're not worried that you bring about the result that you fear, which is that these things shoot, by taking something that gets half an hour to go there and might be detected in route. Well, again, I guess I, I, I keep going around the same equation, which is that um, if you're asking me, would a U.S. would a, le a leader contemplate a nuclear attack against a mobile missile force? I think, as I suggested with Russia, at a certain point it becomes untenable, given current ISR capabilities, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, if you decide to go against that mobile force, I, I, I'm not, you know, we'd have to do the analysis of whether or not you'd have a greater likelihood of getting in there and destroying those tells with ballistic missiles fired in a way um, uh, uh, that was optimal for that, or whether it was B-2 delivered munitions. Again, the big challenge, as, as you know, it was with mobile missiles, tel t um, teleporter electors and launchers, which basically are the mobile missiles, is uh, not just finding them, right? We can often find them, but when you're using conventional munitions, you need to find them at the moments before a conventional munition would actually hit. The benefit of nuclear weapons is that you have a broader area in which you could do barrage attacks, calculate the speed of tells, fix a location, and you know within a certain area where it might be. Again, I, I kind of think that this, um, in, in some ways, it detracts from the story. I mean, A, what does that mean? Does all this mean the damage limitation against um, uh, adversaries that don't have mobiles makes sense, because that is one implication of it. The, well, I, you tell me, does North Korea have mobile missiles? Yeah. Okay, and, and, it, and so, so we, we are in a condition of mutual vulnerability with, the chi with uh, North Korea at the nuclear level? Because uh, that's news Well, given we can't, well, it's not news to the Defense Science Board. I mean, you have the slight problem here that if you think, if you acknowledge North Korea has hundreds of mobile missiles, North Korea actually has more mobile missiles than Russia Long does. Long range mobile missiles. That's oh, what we're cool. talking about. We're talking about right because he's not, he's not he's not saying he's not saying that our allies aren't going to get Again, their hair mustard. It's bit. either that James believes that a nuke is a nuke is a nuke. I don't. I think qualitative characteristics matter. I think different yields matter. I think it matters whether you kill millions of people or thousands. I believe that it matters that uh, um, uh, the kinds of forces that you're going after. It's all, it's a matter of context, and in some contexts, like Russia today, or Russia in, in, in the, in the mid-80s, I would not recommend, you know, serious, I wouldn't get wrapped around the axle about damage limitation planning, but how does that obviate a damage limitation planning in many other scenarios? So there were two, two questions. The second was, 
um, uh, a de subs, is that the end of the story? My, my response about that was that um, if it's a reference about whether we can get them all, right, I think at the point that they're subs, it may or may not. I don't actually think that, you know, a Chinese submarine force of two armed with ballistic missiles is the end of the possibility of the United States getting all long-range Chinese systems. Um, uh, uh, but what uh, uh, a Chinese sub certainly doesn't do is obviate counter the need for counterforce capabilities in a coercive nuclear escalatory campaign in which now James is suggesting he does have a response. He wouldn't do anything. He would use large yield W-88 submarine fire missiles against targets on the North Korean peninsula, which, by the way, would result in the deaths of millions and millions of people, probably in South, definitely in South Korea, and probably in Japan, too. This is crazy. And barrage attacks against Chinese mobile missiles, which generally use the roads on the east coast of China, wouldn't cause massive civilian casualties? Barrage attacks? Uh, uh, <laughs> Come on. You can't have... You, firstly, firstly, you have... Firstly, firstly, you have much, much more choice, chance of finding isolated... The civilian casualties fundamentally depends on whether or not the target is isolated. Um, if it's an isolated target, then uh, existing weapons in the U.S. arsenal, which incidentally are not all massive high yield. No, I wasn't advocating sticking one megaton, not that the U.S. has a bomb that large anymore, one megaton on Pyongyang. What I am suggesting is um, uh, attacking, uh, if you can find them, military targets that aren't right next to gigantic population centers. Why not what attack you are, them with what lower you yield are, weapons? What you are suggesting, well, because, 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 because at the moment we're having a damage limitation debate. I'm, I don't, I don't, I just, the fundamental issue with reducing civilian casualties is the isolation of the target, not the yield of the weapon. Um, let me answer Linton's question. Um, Linton, Keir asked me what I would do if North Korea had used missile, uh, nuclear weapons first. So I was focusing on the case of uh, what I would do in that scenario. If North Korea hadn't used nuclear missiles first, um, there is a tremendous risk to using, to trying to take out their tells. Because if you can't take them all, take them all out, you are pretty much certain that they're gonna use whatever you can't take out. So given that, um, as Keir now seems to be acknowledging, uh, we're gonna be far less than 100% effective, I wouldn't want to take an action that would bring about exactly what I'm trying to avoid. Um, and I would rather take my chance that deterrence will hold. It might fail. I've said throughout no point of this debate that deterrence is certain to work. What I am saying is that Keir doesn't provide a solution to this real problem. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, we're clearly focusing on the strategic implications here, strategic constraints, opportunities, et cetera. And, and again, um, you know, I'm comfortable making the argument just at that level. To me, a president, again, facing those option A and option B has a, a clear reason to, to uh, prefer option A, in part because it still holds out the prospect of de-escalating that kind of conflict. Uh, an adversary uses a nuclear weapon in a limited way uh, regionally. The United States doesn't have to launch a splendid first strike against all kinds of um, the entire force, including its mobile missiles and silos. Um, uh, uh, it can use nuclear weapons in a way that's more flexible, more appropriate for the kind of escalation that's occurred. The fact that it would not kill millions of people also has a huge ethical implication. It's the ethical implication which drives a president to want to prefer A over B, right? If it's all just what we can do with the, the weapons, it's all the same, right? Um, but that is a difference. There's also another moral dimension to this, which is our commitment to our allies. If we're not prepared, you know, to take steps to, um, uh, uh, if, we, if we don't believe there's a difference between two nuclear weapons used against um, Japanese forces versus 20, right, then we should not have that commitment. And James and I may end up agreeing on this. I don't, I, I don't know. I would seriously have us reconsider our alliance commitments if we're not going to build the kind of force or retain the kind of force that would protect them. That seems to me on the verge of being immoral, to make a commitment that you have no intention of, of uh, uh, fulfilling. 
I think the moral issues are actually very important here. And I think it's about, you know, the fundamental moral question for me is how can we minimize the chances that nuclear weapons are used without undermining international security? Um, you know, if there were absolutely no chance that nuclear weapons could ever be used, then there would, deterrence would be entirely ineffective, and you know, presumably we would be living in a less safe world. Um, so, you know, for me, I, the moral issues are, I think Keir presents a strategy that for all the reasons I've outlined is, A, it's unlikely to work, so I don't see it, you know, reducing the loss of life by being a more effective strategy. Uh, and B, it potentially makes the problem worse by inducing crisis instabilities. So, um, you know, by that kind of um, moral metric of um, preventing nuclear weapons being used weighed against, um, you know, preserving international security, I don't see this as being a, a difficult moral question. Um, okay, uh, you know, I think on missile defense, look, um, Daryl Press and I have made the case for retaining counterforce capabilities. Tonight I've made the case for maintaining and improving uh, damage limitation capabilities, meaning counterforce capabilities. Um, we think nuclear weapons play an important role in damage limitation, uh, but, but the obvious implication or the obvious um, point to make here is that um, nuclear weapons are a part of a robust set of counterforce capabilities, damage limitation capabilities, all of which I'm in favor of pursuing because I believe that the most plausible deterrence challenge is likely to arise in a coercive, in a conventional conflict with a regional nuclear armed adversary, and therefore all of these capabilities will be useful. Con conventional precision strike, in some cases maybe anti-submarine warfare, critical ISR components that we've talked about, cyber, and of course, missile defense. Do I think that, you know, hit to kill is, uh, am I more optimistic about missile defense today than I was even in 2006? I think the answer is yes. In that article, we just simply made the point that a missile defense system would be seen by any potential adversary uh, for its mop-up role in a, in a first strike. And uh, earlier, James took a dig at the earlier analysis, which I, I just find surprising. I mean, here we are in the article saying, um, on paper, for the first time in decades, we can model, model based on a certain set of Herculean assumptions, whatever you want to call it, a first strike against the Russian nuclear force, which would, su which would succeed in a way that analysts hadn't been able to do. For us, we said we were agnostic. This could be troubling, right? If you thought that U.S. nuclear uh, capabilities made others feel insecure and they would respond in dangerous ways, we said if you had a much more, you know, primacist or ambitious foreign policy, it might be good news, It'd make us less vulnerable. But again, these are, that was an article about a development that we thought everyone should look at. Uh, and you can draw your own conclusions about what that meant. Marginally. Um, I, 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 you know, the missile threat from Iran is predominantly a shorter range threat right now. Um, the missile threat from North Korea is a shorter range threat right now. Uh, basing the missile defense architecture on technologies that are proven to be more effective against shorter range threats um, seems to me it's more likely it's going to work. Um, I, um, US, existing U.S. missile defenses are not designed to deal with countermeasures, and that, that's going to limit their utility as the, Russian, uh, as the Iranian and the North Korean threats proceed. But right now, again, in a very, very hard problem, I think the existing missile defense architecture is probably the best that's available. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Lieber, I, you, you said that, that James assumes a nuke is a nuke. Um, uh, are you assuming, maybe assuming that a war is a war? Um, I think that, uh, that another way to deal with this issue is through signaling. Um, and so with you actually Way to handle that signaling problem 
find another way out. And th th it's probably less unnerving to people in Japan or South Korea. If there's, because if, if I'm them, I'm just thinking, okay, the U.S. is going to war with North Korea, or I mean, the Middle East and the U.S. is going to war with, with, with Iran. I'm probably less comfortable knowing that the U.S. has pursued the capabilities and has advertised the capabilities to, to, to launch a disarmament first strike. Um, would, how would you, I mean, is that a, a possible way out? Or, or have you given that any thought? Yeah, so. Yeah, thanks. I mean, um, uh, for the, you know, of the two pathways to this world, which I'm deeply concerned about, and of course everyone is, about the problem, of course, of nuclear escalation in a conventional conflict, your question addresses the inadvertent path, right, which is that the American way of war, blinding and confusing our enemy, um, leads to certain dynamics that would result in nuclear use. Could we, as one policy, uh, alternative policy solution to this, be to change the way that we fight wars? And the answer is, yeah, we could consider doing that. But what you'd have to calculate are the trade-offs in cost and U.S. lives. I mean, the reason that we take out our adversaries' uh, uh, eyes and ears is because we're protecting our own soldiers and our own pilots. And that would come with real costs. The other issue, so again, that might make sense, um, and it probably does make sense to try and think about ways that we fight wars that would not uh, undermine their confidence in their nuclear retaliatory capability. But the rational path is the, really the one that uh, triumphs in this case, right? Which is that we can fight the war any way we want, but the prospect of conventional victory against that adversary, given the track record, given our forces, our conventional superiority, is can't take away, right, the idea that nuclear weapons are uh, a guarantee of security. They're a weapon of the week. They're the trump card. Just in the same way the United States relied on nuclear weapons in the Cold War, right, to protect Western Europe, Others will rely on nuclear weapons to uh, uh, keep their regimes in power when facing the prospect of a conventional uh, defeat. Yeah, I think when I was um, doing my grilling of James uh, with the first three questions, the first was, you know, would you advocate damage limitation against North Korea? Um, Iran was the second one, and that's, you know, a, a future nuclear arms, Syria. I mean, you can come up with the list. For me, sure, the logic of my argument applies in all of those cases. If the United States has commitments all around the world, right? We have a lot. We extend the nuclear umbrella over a heck of a lot of people. Unless you believe that that commitment is not that meaningful because we won't get involved in conventional conflicts in which our adversaries are likely to face tremendous rational incentives to escalate to the nuclear level because they're about to lose that conventional war, um, uh, then, uh, uh, well, now I lost the train of thought. What was that? That was an if then. That was a long if. Um, uh, the logic applies in, in all of those cases. Um, the solutions, other than um, signaling in a way, fighting American way of war that, that doesn't uh, undermine 
uh, our adversary. The real solution is either not to fight in ways that would lead to regime change, which would require a pretty drastic change in the way that America fights wars, um, or it implies um, the retraction of American alliance commitments around the world. I, I think in many ways, even with a damage limitation strategy, the extension of the, US, of the nuclear umbrella is going to be incredibly problematic. Alliance relations are, are going to be incredibly problematic as we move forward in this new world. The Cold War is over. It's a new world and it's a disturbing world. So I don't think there's any single answer to that question, which I think is a very profound question. Um, you know, the first thing is, um, if the U.S. enjoys conventional superiority, um, nuclear threats, it has to rely less on nuclear threats, though the conventional superiority I've agreed throughout this debate with Keir uh, can lead to adverse reuse of nuclear weapons. Uh, but, you know, clearly if you enjoy conventional superiority, you force the other side to decide to escalate to nukes, which you'd rather be in than you having to escalate to nukes. Um, secondly, um, I, you know, I, I think you just have to rely on quote unquote classical deterrence. Um, which is not guaranteed to succeed. Uh, and if Iran does get nuclear weapons, you know, I'd love to say there was some magic bullet, some guaranteed formula that would ensure that deterrence was going to work. That doesn't exist. Um, I recall that, you know, during the Cold War, you know, when China got nuclear weapons, that was not greeted with, um, oh, we don't really care by the U.S. I mean, China was the uber-rogue state of its day. I mean, the Soviet Union was the uber-rogue state when it got nuclear weapons. So I think we shouldn't look back through the Cold War with rose-tinted spectacles and pretend that at the time these were two mature states that fully understood one another, because it wasn't like that at all, and deterrence held. So, you know, I can't guarantee that deterrence is going to work today. Um, but, um, I, you know, for all of the reasons we've been going into, I don't think Keir's solution solves that problem. Uh, the best solution is clearly to prevent Iran from getting nuclear weapons at all. Uh, but unfortunately, I think I'm not terribly optimistic about that happening right now. Could I just one more comment, I guess? Uh, that situation you mentioned with China and Russia. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was loud enough. Okay. Um, I, that situation you, you mentioned, uh, I, I developed a term for that called nuclear-induced rationality. And uh, whereas I think it worked in the case of China and Russia, I'm not sure that it could work in the case of Iran because I think the very definition of rationality is different. And there are other elements of it that we'd have to bring in. But uh, uh, if I could, if you could indulge me, uh, consider yourself as a, a planner in Israel, given the, the size of the country, the constraints, and so forth. And you have to, de uh, you know, what decision would you make? Would you essentially sell for a national decision that would say, okay, we'll, uh, we'll accept the mutual assured destruction type of uh, condition with Iran, or given your asymmetrical vulnerabilities and so forth, do you, do you structure a force that's capable of carrying out first strikes and war winning strategies? Uh, and I want to apologize if I'm off the track. My internal G, uh, GPS went off somewhere in D.C., so I, I got lost. So qu a quick answer and then we'll move on to closing statements. Um, The disagreement, I mean, Israel clearly has a massively unpalatable choice. Do you attack Iranian nuclear facilities and try to prevent it from getting the bomb by force if diplomatic means fail, or do you try to live with deterrence? I'm incredibly gl glad I'm not an Israeli decision maker. Um, I don't think that um, structuring a force around damage limitation vis-a-vis -vis Iran is practical for Israel, um, because it's one thing flooding the skies over a small adjacent nation like Lebanon with UAVs to hunt down mobile missiles. Uh, it's an entirely different issue to do it over Iran. Uh, and more than that, don't forget, you know, the Israeli success over Hezbollah involved things like destroying tells after they had launched missiles. That's clearly, you know, I think your two bomb point is exactly right. And, you know, if Iran gets the bomb, Israel does not have a technical capability at its disposal to uh, produce perfect, to completely disarm Iran. I'm sure it wishes it had, but 
it, that technical capability simply does not exist. Just very quick. I mean, if deterrence is going to work against Iran, it's more likely to work with Israel's own nuclear strategy in response, whether it's an acceptance of MAD or whether it's pursuit of a first strike capability. Uh, the problem here is when you have a third party extending deterrence to an ally, uh, in which case the, the threat to respond to any nuclear use with the destruction of millions of people by blowing up cities or hitting targets with high yield nuclear weapons uh, in response to a um, a, a, a relatively limited nuclear escalation is, um, is incredible. So to me, if the United States pulls out of Asia, and I'm not recommending it does, and Japan goes nuclear, and South Korea acquires its own nuclear weapons, I think the problem, of course, of nuclear escalation is reduced. Okay, let's uh, move on to some quick closing statements, and James, we'll start with you this time, just a couple minutes, and then back to Dr. Lee. Practicality. Okay, is the central issue that divides the two of us. I thought it was pretty interesting that Keir acknowledged he wouldn't try a damage limitation strategy against Russia, because China has basically the same number of mobile missiles as Russia does. You know, Russia only has ICBMs. China has a limited number of ICBMs, but it has its MRBMs and its uh, I IRBMs as well. So I'm kind of surprised that Kiev thinks damage limitation against China might be practical, whereas it's not against Russia when they have exactly the same number of missiles, uh, uh, mobile missiles, and North Korea has even more. Um, another issue that came up here is, you know, this is the question of demonstrating that the strategy is practical. What Kiev has done, and I do not question this piece of modeling for one second, is demonstrate that the U.S. has a 99.9 .9 whatever it is percent probability of destroying 20 Chinese silo-based ICBMs. My issue is not with the modeling, it's with the scenario. What I've given you is the U.S. attempts in the Gulf War, Israeli attempts in the war against Hezbollah, as well as the Defense Science Board based on classified studies of the type that Kia wants all of which suggest the United States does not have the capability to meaningfully limit damage in a war against states with significant number of mobile, ice, uh, of mobile missiles. And the final issue I want to flag up is how good does damage limitation have to be to make a difference? You know, Keir's kind of been shifting on this because back in the nukes we need in 2009, he talked about, quote, completely disarming an adversary. Now he takes the attitude, oh, well, we don't have to take everything out at the beginning of a nuclear war. Um, and there's a couple of reasons he could, th he, he could be arguing that. Firstly, because he thinks that it would be incredible for a US adversary to use its short-range forces. The problem with that is any likely conventional conflict involving the US would be over extended deterrence commitments, making US allies a target. So the idea that you can't, um, the idea that there wouldn't be credible targets for these shorter range forces, I think is incredible. And secondly, the other reason he could say it doesn't matter if we don't have to take everything out right at the beginning is because he doesn't care if these forces are used at the beginning of this war. Because you know, 20, 30 million casualties, tops, depended on the breaks. Um, and again, but that is inconsistent with everything he's been talking about previously involving, you know, the need to have a, ensure that a president can avoid um, um, a conflict leading to massive casualties against U.S. allies. So he's trying to have it both ways. On the one hand, arguing that you need to do everything, and then when you, he's pushed on that, saying it doesn't matter that you have to do everything. The simple reality is the strategy that he advocates is not practical and will only make matters worse. Thank you. It's ironic that practicality would be the uh, first issue brought up by James. And rather than um, suggest that many of the things he's just suggested are inaccurate portrayals of my views, the beauty is we have it online and we can go back and watch the videotape. And one of the things I'd like you to go back and watch the videotape and look for is an answer, a practical answer to how the United States would deal with the problem of coercive nuclear escalation, which we would be brought about uh, uh, by our participation in a conventional war in defense of an ally. There is no solution. At one point, he suggested using uh, uh, large yield nuclear weapons against uh, um, hopefully isolated targets. He also suggested at one point we'd go after fleeting assets. That sure sounds like damage limitation capability to me. And my point is that you're getting there. You're getting there. But once you start treating damage limitation as a serious response, you might think about what kinds of forces are, would be most useful in what scenarios. 
James has tried to make most of this debate about something that's less important, about Chinese mobile missiles. And he wants to engage me in a debate about whether or not the United States, you know, could definitely go after Chinese mobile missiles. I could make, I could have responded with an argument about we, the deployment areas for the DF-31As in particular, Haijilong province, particularly mountainous, we know the road areas, suggested even more that, that I actually know about ISR capabilities and that we're getting there. This is a, this is a, a, a red herring. The key question is, what do you do when faced with coercive nuclear escalation, which is a highly plausible scenario? If you can look me in the face, straight in the face, and say it makes no difference whether we have damage limitation capabilities or not, I would suggest that you certainly can't say that to your allies with a straight face. And it's a stance that will likely lead us into a worse world uh, than doing nothing. So if practicality is the, the key question, um, is the, if it's a call for practicality, I'm on board 100%. Um, I have no ideological reason to like damage limitation. It seems to be the most practical response to um, what would be a, a truly dark uh, scenario of deterrence. Um, so right before this debate, uh, Kira asked me what makes the best in our series. And I said, when both sides are willing to directly address what the other side has said, instead of just pretending like they agree. And I think we got exactly that in this debate. So please thank both of our participants. Hey, thank you. Okay.